many of us begin our day with a hot cup of tea or coffee. But today, you know what? We decided we are going to be talking to the people who are in charge of bringing that tea and coffee to our homes, processing it, exporting it, and of course, making sure it's also in our supermarkets for us. And so today, I have the Group Managing Director for Sassini PLC, and that is Mr. Martin Ocheng. We're going to talk a little bit about the company as well as its outlook and more. But first, why don't you have a look at his profile? Martin Ocheng is a holder of a first-class honours Bachelor of Science degree from Moore University and an MBA in Strategic Management from Oxford Brookes University, UK. He is a current member of the Board of Directors of the United Nations Global Compact Network Kenya and Sassini PLC Managing. Martin has extensive global leadership and work experience across the pharmaceutical, FMCG and services industry in North America, Europe, Asia, the Middle East, South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. He has worked for 3M Healthcare, Warner Lambert Pharmaceuticals, Pfizer Incorporated KWV International, Tyco International, GHM South Africa, SGA Kenya and now Sassini PLC in various marketing, commercial and managing leadership roles. He is a decorated recipient of the FISA Global Innovators Circle and has been in several global strategic and operational councils covering the pharmaceutical and service industries and has a deep passion for designing, implementing and evaluating strategy and he currently has overall responsibility and leadership of Kenya's biggest locally owned agriculture business. So thank you for joining us on the trading bell today. Thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure being here and thanks for having me. Absolutely. Yeah. So we do like to always delve into the numbers and I believe when it comes to Sassini, um, the last year, especially of course uh, ended year September 2019, we, yeah. ha we saw net losses of about 337 million um, from the company, which is shocking compared to the previous year because that's when there was a net profit of 293 million. Um, you know, could you just give us a bit of a lay of the land? What led to that point? Yeah, thanks. That's a, a very good question. I think it's a, a very nice place to start because uh, numbers do tell a serious story in most businesses. As you would know, Sassini is an agricultural business. It's Kenya's biggest agricultural setup. And uh, traditionally, our business has been based on uh, commodity products, tea and coffee. Uh, up to about three or four years ago when we diversified into macadamia and avocado as well, and we have a small little division that sells value-added products in the local market. So the reason I mention that is there's a need for one to understand what happens in commodity trading. Mm -hmm. And if your business is based on commodity trading, then there's one aspect of your business you don't have control of, and that's commodity prices in the auction. So we sell our tea uh, up to about uh, mid last year, 80% of our teas uh, that we produce are sold through the auction, the tea auction in Mombasa and about 60% of the coffee that we mill and produce as well is sold through the Nairobi Coffee Exchange. And uh, we've seen um, uh, global tea prices collapse about 16 months ago and they've stayed down. The effect of that is uh, you don't have control of what the selling price is, so what the market looks for is when the, when the prices collapse like that for you to absorb that reduction. Uh, and uh, unfortunately for us, we don't just do tea, we do tea and coffee and uh, in the last one year we had collapses in both crops. So the things that we have in our sort of like hands that we can control are our cost of production. Unfortunately, I think the industry and the way it's set up and Sassini is not different. Uh, it's, it's not one of those things you can react to very quickly. So the reaction to that needs to be strategic, needs to be operational as well, but it does take time. So a lot of that loss is uh, driven by uh, tea and coffee prices being way below the cost of production for both commodities. So that is one. We had, and that drove about maybe 80% of that number that you quote. Then we had also in that financial year some special items, uh, some CapEx items that we wrote off and uh, sort of like took in the books and that contributed to that loss as well. But lastly, to answer that question is uh, you do see the first item that I was talking about which uh, relates to global uh, commodity prices fluctuate like that. It's very cyclical. It happens without fail almost every five to seven years. Uh, you'll see a drop uh, in, 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 in in realization in the auctions. A lot of it is driven by oversupply, too much production of tea at a particular time. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, Kenya is the third largest producer or has the third largest um, amount of tea produced mm -hmm. by a country. 
but it's the world's biggest uh, black tea exporter. And uh, we come after China and India. And those two countries, yeah, the, China has about 2 million hectares under tea. Uh, almost 100% of that is consumed in China, and it's mainly green tea. India comes a second uh, with about 1.4 million hectares under tea, and Kenya is a distant third with about just over 400,000 hectares under tea. And um, be because of India and China consuming a lot of their teas uh, locally, mm. uh, we are the biggest exporter. And so um, when we have our production in Kenya, you see the demand and supply curve coming in, and so our prices get depressed. And uh, that, unfortunately, was the case last year, and that affects companies like ours uh, very aggressively. Second to that is we're not just affected in tea, we're affected in coffee as well. So when you have both commodities and a cost of production, you see it in the numbers. Okay, so a lot of factors there. Um, you did mention that, you know, of course, we are big on the exports. Now, yeah. when we look at the fact that as of Friday the 13th, 2020, the Ministry of Health in Kenya has already confirmed that the coronavirus is here. Yeah. We've, of course, seen confirmations across the globe of the same. Um, we've, been, uh, we've seen that it's now uh, been termed a pandemic. Um, and of course, a lot of countries and a lot of uh, exchanges, we're talking about the FTSE, we're talking about the Dow Jones, they've all seen plunges in terms of uh, their numbers. You know, exports, how are you planning to somehow safeguard yourself from that hit? I don't know whether you'd classify a pandemic like that as a natural disaster occurring naturally because you don't plan for it. Yeah. And so when it comes, uh, uh, some companies and some businesses are able to react to that. Um, it is going to affect us and in fact is already affecting us directly because in two ways. One is uh, shipments out of uh, Kenya, especially into the Asian subcontinent and specifically to China because that's the epicenter of where the disease came from. Mm -hmm. And so you're seeing a lot of, uh, and, and shipments either way, so shipments to and shipments from China. Uh, if, if they haven't reduced yet, you're going to see a reduction in that as people are, are taking more precaution to try and contain the disease. We fortunately don't drive a lot of volume into China specifically, but we send our avocados and macadamias into some customers that we have in the subcontinent in Asia. And so we expect some disruption. To be honest, in the last one week, we've seen uh, uh, certain uh, big customers, on, especially on the fruit side of our business, uh, telling us to wait a week or two weeks to see what's happening before we start exporting to them. So unfortunately, it's a negative effect. Uh, and uh, Sassini, probably because it's a wholly export business, will be adversely affected. Absolutely. And um, our intention is to try and mitigate those as much as possible, obviously. Hopefully, uh, the pandemic gets contained as quickly as the world can. Uh, so that's one way, shipment. The second way, which we've already uh, stopped, is uh, you're going to see us being affected in business travel. So mm -hmm. because our business is export, our customers and clients are abroad, it requires us to go out there to look for them and talk to them and build the relationships and sort of like grow that base. We are unable to do that at the moment because a lot of these countries, mainly in Europe and North America, uh, we have not travel bans, but we are taking precaution ourselves so that we don't expose our colleagues and ourselves to to, to conditions that would be detrimental to them. And so that again might slow you know, the effort that we have every year in driving our business going forward. Um, I think that as a company, uh, and I would be surprised if there was any company that would say we were prepared for this when it was announced, I think what is important is how quickly you can adjust what you do to mitigate the negative effect of these pandemic uh, outbreaks whenever they occur. Uh, so, yeah, hopefully they get contained uh, to contain this very quickly and uh, we can go back to business as usual. Absolutely, and yeah. of course uh, it's affecting a lot of people that we keep in our prayers as well. Mm. Um, let's talk a little bit about the avocado ban that we had seen uh, come in effect uh, around November 15th, and that was the ban on avocado export. Um, where do you stand with that and how much should it affect your business as well? I think there's a lot of misconception about that ban. Mm. Um, uh, the, the government body, the uh, AFA, that controls the export movement of fruit and nuts and mainly agricultural products, uh, has a window within which you can't export the product. Every year it happens. Uh, I, I think there's just a lot more news around it 
uh, this time when it happened in November. And the key reason for that is to protect the quality of the fruit that we get from this market. Mm -hmm. um, a big chunk of the avocado fruit that is exported out of Kenya ends up in Europe. They have very stringent import uh, standards and levels. And so uh, for you to be able to protect the Kenyan avocado brand as an industry, we have to ensure that you know the, the product that is being harvested is harvested mature and is exported under the best conditions to arrive and ripen in the market where we are sending them with the best uh, possibility to, be, to, to, to fetch the best pricing. And so every year Alpha puts into, uh, into effect a window within which you can't export because the fruits are not ready for export. If you don't do that, what you get is uh, some exporters or some companies or some individual farmers start to export immature fruit and uh, that negatively impacts on the quality of, uh, uh, of the fruit that they're exporting but also more importantly impacts on the perception the market has of Kenyan fruit and so it's really really important for us that uh, the window is open when the fruit is mature and that that export then helps us to build the, uh, the, the Kenya fruit uh, brand. Kenya is the third largest producer of avocado in the world and so as we build we've just surpassed South Africa and as you build that you want to ensure that that comes with quality as well. So these bands are, are necessary uh, to enforce that. And we as a CINI support that. Uh, we support the idea of uh, opening the windows when the fruit is mature. As you know, avocado is not a full year mm -hmm. harvest cycle. We've got three, four months in which to trade. And so it's very important for Sassini uh, and I guess for the avocado industry that that quality is maintained. And so that's why the ban was there. Okay. Um, moving uh, back to the company in terms of the labor force, yeah. uh, we did see quite a, a number of uh, you know people retrenched. We saw close to 240 in January, I believe, were the numbers that came out. You can clarify for us, um, and some last year as well. You know, this wave of retrenchments, we've actually seen quite a few um, companies do the same in Kenya across the board last year. But specifically uh, with yourselves, you know. Why was that ne necessitated at that point? And is there any way to kind of prevent getting to that point? I, I think there's a misconception around that particular topic with Sassini specifically. Mm. We didn't retrench per se. We have a, a labor force, uh, uh, especially that works in the field that we contract on an annual basis. And we contract them on a need to respond to the amount of crop we need to work with. And um, invariably, in some years, that crop yield is higher. In some years, it's lower. And so if you look at our annual reports over the last several years, you'll see movement in staff. It really talks to that level. Mm. So it's not retrenchment. Uh, that, that's not true. Um, so, so that's the one point to clarify. The second point is, as I talked earlier about our cost of production, uh, which is the one key aspect of our business that we have under control, uh, we've been looking um, at ways of bringing that down. One of, the, one of the things that we have to do is to use technology more and better to help us to bring our cost of production so that we are competitive. And so in that way, start to mitigate a bit of these price fluctuations we see in the market. And so um, you, somebody might ask, why do you give annual contracts? One, because that's the nature of the job. And two, it allows you to review how you input costs into that segment of your business um, annually. And so the number you're referring to, 240, is correct, uh, but it wasn't a retrenchment uh, exercise. It was uh, people whose contracts had come to an end. And if you look today, for example, you'll see that number has gone up because the yield is higher. We've had rains continuously for the last five months, and so you need more hands in the field. Uh, if you look again in six months, it might go down because maybe we've mechanized a bit more. So it's a moving number, and it's not retrenchment, it's just contracts that are coming in and out of the business. You mentioned digitization. Um, what is one of the biggest uh, opportunities that you've seen open up when you go towards the more digital side of things and moving towards actually uh, becoming even more fully digitized? I, I think it's more than digitization. So it's just general automation of the business. I think that uh, Kenya has had agriculture at its backbone for a very long time. It continues to, to, to be the case. Uh, as much as we want to drive ICT as uh, something of the future, and it is, 
we can't run away from the fact that our economy is backboned on agriculture. Mm. Uh, and there are two ways of doing that. The bulk of our agricultural products, especially the ones that we export, uh, come from small-scale farmers. So someone with half an acre, an acre to five acres, maybe ten acres. And then the other half would probably come from plantation groups like Sassini. Um, um, the reason that uh, some of the products we've seen struggling in the agricultural sector uh, with the attracting good pricing is because we've not had a very strong uh, hands-on approach with controlling the costs that are going to the production of these products. And so uh, because we've stayed labor intensive, um, the work that is done is done by human beings, by a set of hands, and I'm not saying that's wrong, but it's become very expensive with escalation in labor costs every year. Uh, and so a lot of companies uh, that have these plantations look into different ways of doing this and these technologies all over the world uh, you know that you can employ from right from harvesting all the way to value addition and so uh, Sassini is bang on in that space at the moment uh, so the biggest opportunity we have is to tackle our cost of production uh, by rolling out um, this automation in aspects of our value chain that would give us back the benefit of reducing the cost protect our investments better, uh, allow us to produce better quality, uh, more efficiently, uh, and attract a good price uh, by reducing that gap you have between your COP, your cost of production, and your realization in the auction market or wherever you sell privately. So, and that's not just a Sassini thing. I think you're seeing that uh, challenge across all uh, of our industry, especially in the tea, in the tea sector. Uh, the big plantations are uh, aggressively looking at ways to reduce the amount of money that we spend producing a kilo of tea mm. or a kilo of coffee. And uh, that's going to continue going forward because we want to be sustainable, we want to do it responsibly, and we want to do it sustainably. Uh, and so it, it's, it's something that is not starting now. It's been in the, in the industry for quite some time. A lot of it is around mechanization of processes, for example, harvesting, transport, um, modernizing the factories uh, so that you're using more modern, uh, less labor-intensive processes as opposed to what we've been used to in the past. So we're going to continue to do that because we'd like to secure the future of the organization by being sustainable. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, coming back, of course, recently the NSC uh, did join uh, seven stock exchange around the world to bring the bell for gender equality. And uh, tell us a little bit about the policies that you know your company has adopted in order to close existing gender gaps. We are very deliberate about that it comes under our sustainability uh, pillar in our strategic framework. So there, there are several things we've, uh, we've chosen to do going forward as an organization. Uh, one, obviously, uh, is to you know drive a performance culture to make sure that we celebrate our successes. We put a lot more deliberate effort in doing what we do to be successful. Secondly, which is probably the most important pillar, is focusing on cost containment and cost management in our cost of production so that we keep that at a level that we are comfortable with to make us profitable, of course, but more importantly, to make us sustainable. We want our great-grandchildren to find a great organization that we set up for them. Thirdly, is uh, to continue to drive uh, commercial activities uh, that bring in the revenue and hopefully a lot of that revenue flows into the bottom line so that you have money to reinvest uh, and that is why we diversified into macadamia and avocado to mm -hmm. expand our revenue stream so we reduce our reliance on tea and coffee uh, and that's a, a focus that you'll see us continuing to look at uh, when we see those opportunities we'll explore them Fourthly, uh, is to focus on our talent, the people that work at our organization, and, and, and empowering them, giving them the best environments to work in, uh, and uh, skilling them, upskilling them to ensure that they can give us back exactly what we want to drive the results that we seek. Fifth is to improve on our financial performances, the numbers that you've talked about, make sure that we have enough reserves to take care of the organization going forward, but also to reward all our stakeholders, from our shareholders, our directors, and our employees, and all those regulatory bodies that we work with. Mm. Uh, because it, it, and we, as you would know, being a listed company, it's really, really critical that your financial standing is strong. Lastly, which is the pillar that uh, takes uh, you know, into account what you're talking about, is to do all this sustainably. And so in that sustainability pillar, we have four key things that we work with. One is uh, general adherence to proper human rights. We treat mm. everybody properly. Uh, 
in accordance with the sustainable development goals. Two is to have labor practices that uh, are clean uh, and sustainable for the organization. Even when we, we bring in technology, we manage those transitions in a way that, are fa that, that is fair to everybody, fair to ourselves, fair to whoever is affected. Lastly is a zero tolerance to, uh, to corruption. We just uh, want to create a corruption-free environment in Sassini, and that calls for us to be deliberate about that. And there's a deliberate uh, skill towards uh, driving uh, our gender parity so that we do have a 50-50 balance uh, with regard to all levels of our employment. The agricultural sector is traditionally male-dominated, mm -hmm. and so if you want to make a difference, you've got to be deliberate about it. So I'm very excited that uh, we participated in the bell ringing uh, uh, session and uh, that we get given the opportunity to showcase what we are doing as an organization and hopefully okay. other organizations can look at that and copy us. Absolutely. Thank mm. you so much. And I'd like to wrap up with a vital, important question, I would say. Do you prefer tea or coffee? Uh, I personally grew up drinking tea. Okay. And, uh, and so somebody would think, and I guess a lot of Kenyans uh, say they are tea drinkers. Uh, uh, coffee was an acquired taste for me when I got to the university yeah. and uh, sort of like got onto it from the wrong side because I had a roommate who used to tell me that if you want to stay up studying, drink coffee, it will stimulate you and, yeah. you, and you won't go to bed. Uh, I, I don't really have a, a specific preference, but in saying that, uh, I think those two crops are extremely important for our agricultural segment. I think tea, from what I remember, I may not have the exact number, contributes to about 7% of our GDP mm -hmm. on its own as an industry. And so uh, it, it becomes extremely important that uh, we take care of that. So the whole industry produces about 550 million kilos of black tea. 4% of that is drunk locally. So it tells you, even though Kenyans think we're a tea drinking or a tea consuming market, we really are not. We're only consuming about 4% of what we produce. And so it's really important for companies like Sassini to be involved in growing that category, growing that culture, and growing the aspect of you need to drink tea for all its health benefits, for all its recreational benefits, and for the fact that we grow it. We, we, we really must be proud Take pride about in it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Coffee, on the other hand, is growing well ahead of tea um, globally and in Kenya as well, okay. driven by the cafe culture, driven by the need to meet at Java or at Art Cafe to over a cup of coffee, <laughs> they say. Yes. And so we are aided from that perspective. But you're seeing a general global trend of uh, consumers looking for health foods. And so hopefully we can ride on that wave to try and drive a lot of more consumption uh, across those two beverages. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so, so mm. much for all your insight, all your wisdom. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you so much.